people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. The air passenger volume of a country can be seen as an unofficial marker of the health of its economy and a reflection of its citizens' purchasing power. More travelers can indicate a stronger economy. Thanks to India's strong economic foundation and policies, her aviation story, which began slowly, has now taken off and is flying at the highest altitude. With new airports being inaugurated at a fast clip and airlines placing orders in hundreds, India is set to be a global aviation hub. The Indian aviation industry, together with reliable industry players, is set to grow in both size and repute. Join us as we explore the current state of the aviation industry in the country and how the infusion of more capital will launch the industry's years ahead. In a historic deal, Tata Sons led Air India placed a massive order of 470 Boeing and Airbus aircrafts last month to meet the sudden surge in the aviation demand in the country. The deal, worth around 100 billion USD, comprises the purchase of a wide range of aircrafts that will cater to the needs of passengers across the economic ladder and of travelers around the world. These deals with Boeing and Airspace were two of the biggest civil aviation deals the world has witnessed to date. It is an opportunity not only for uh, the American economy and for workers here in this country, but it's an opportunity for the Indian people as well. It's an opportunity to deepen what is already uh, a, a uh, profoundly um, uh, intertwined relationship uh, based on um, shared interests, based on shared values, uh, based on our deep economic ties. And with the announcement between Boeing and Air India yesterday, uh, those ties are all the deeper. India is one of the most promising aviation markets in the world. After a brief pandemic-induced lull in her aviation activity in 2020 and 2021, India resurged strongly in 2022 with a 47% rise of air passenger traffic, totaling approximately 123 million people. Market and consumer data specialist Statista recorded that 22 million international passengers touched down at Indian airports in the financial year 2022. India has around 400 airports and airstrips, and of which 153 were operational by the end of 2022. The Indian aviation sector is projected to tread parallel to Indian economic growth in general, which is well placed to grow fastest amongst the major global economies in the next one decade. aviation market जिस तरह देश के मध्यम वर्ग के सपनों को पूरा किया है, वो तो वाकई किसी यूनिवर्सिटी के लिए, एकेडमिक वर्ल्ड के लिए अध्ययन का विषय है। The government's proactive measures, such as capping airfares, coupled with a rapid expansion in budget airlines' fleets and a consistently growing middle-income group in India have greatly contributed to the success of the Indian aviation sector. India is also home to one of the most affordable air markets in the world. These are some of the reasons that many experts around the world believe that Indian carriers can not only become a challenger to Middle Eastern carrier hegemony, but can also surpass them to become the most preferred air carriers globally. Indigo, the biggest domestic air carrier, which flies nearly 1,800 flights a day, is also set to expand its fleet size. As many as 500 aircrafts are on order and will join the Indigo fleet soon. 
we are currently flying a uh, little over 300 aircraft and we have a whopping 500 more on order. Currently we are flying uh, 1800 flights a day and 10% of these flights are to international routes. Our current international flights are concentrated uh, around the Indian subcontinent and, and some other countries around. Uh, the farthest we are flying to the west is uh, to Turkey, Istanbul. India is also on track to have some of the largest airports in the world in the immediate future. With the initial potential of catering up to 12 million people annually, and the expansion potential of 60 million to 120 million passengers over a period of the next 30 years, Noida International Airport in Delhi's satellite city is expected to be operational by 2024. The number of airports are increasing, airlines are also going to increase, so our aviation industry which is growing at such a good speed is a beacon of uh, uh, hope to the entire world. A remarkable aviation journey, which is poised to grow further, is an indication of India's general economic health. The entirety of brand India is booming, as are her individual sectors. Observers say India's aviation sector is one which will greatly promote her reputation around the world in years to come. Moving on. Afghan women who are increasingly bearing the brunt of the Taliban regime are shifting to online education in the continued pursuit of their ambitions. The Taliban, since their return in 2021, have imposed severe restrictions on female freedom in the name of Sharia. Women are barred from higher education, nearly all forms of jobs and even independent public appearance. Women, however, say they are committed to completing their education as it was the only way stability and progress could be restored in the country. Sophia is one of those Afghan women who have taken a resolve to complete their education no matter how many obstructions hit them. She is a regular recipient of English lessons by one of the growing number of educational institutes trying to reach Afghanistan's girls and women who can't go to school. Taliban have imposed severe restrictions on women education citing religious principles. However, the girls are allowed to attend online classes from home. Uh, actually, in that situation, uh, that we are banning from going to school, university or any type of courses. This is a good opportunity for girls, for women in Afghanistan to continue their education, uh, their studies as, uh, in online courses. So this is why I want to continue my studies in online courses. And uh, this is my dream. This is my goal to finish my studying, whatever what happened in Afghanistan. Sophia, who believes education is the only way her country can progress and return to stability it enjoyed once, is optimistic about future. She says the current situation is not going to last forever and women in the country will break the shackles one day. I don't think we will be banned for all the time. It's a temporary banning uh, girls from going to school or uh, taking education because it's not possible that women and girls be at home or um, they keep us in ignorance. This is not possible. Many others like Sophia have been desperately seeking admission into similar schools. Rumi Academy, where Sophia is enrolled and which is one of the most successful institutions in imparting online education in the country, is flooded by the number of applications. Yagona Joy Guzin, there was yet a filly. Hami almost the shall know in a static internet as Barbar Bonwan. یعنی فوق العاده میتونم مفید باشه فوق العاده میتونه ارزشمند باشه بر بانوان و طبیعی از وقت روزانه من ده ها پیام سپاسگزاری خرسندی و رضایت بانوان را میبینم خوب ترین حس ممکن برم پیش میدم such schools however are unable to enroll every woman who seeks education 
Administrative departments of the school say they can't expand much more because they don't have the funds to put more teachers on the payroll and provide them with adequate online infrastructure to enable them to teach. And while this is a constraint on a school's part, women are not equipped to be taught either. With 97% of the country living below poverty line, not many can afford laptops, internet packages and other necessities for online classes. When the Taliban were ousted from power in the weeks following the 9-11 attacks on the United States, hardly anyone had access to the internet. According to the most recent World Bank data gathered prior to the Taliban takeover in August 2021, only 18% of the population had internet connectivity despite nearly 20 years of Western-led intervention and interaction with the rest of the globe. از نگرانی هایی که من در قسمت فعالیت ما دارم اگر روز اینترنت یا برق کلا در افغانستان قطع شوه این کار بر ما خیلی دشوار خواهد ساخت و این یکی از نگرانی هایی است که ما همیشه داشتیم The Taliban have not shown any regard to the repeated ringing of alarms by United Nations The global body has said that the war shattered Afghanistan will have to face significant drop in the assistance amount if it fails to meet human rights parameters in the country. It seems that what progress had been made for Afghan women over the last decades has been virtually washed away. While the country suffers at the hands of the Taliban and their ineffective policies and governance, it is the Afghan women who continue to bear the biggest burden. Moving on. As the Pakistani government lurches from one political crisis to another, the decision makers sitting in Islamabad have decided to go ahead with a digital census exercise that appears to be almost comical, if not for its insidious intent. Flawed in its rollout, criticized by the very politicians that sanction it, the digital census is an attempt to make all the right noises of a functioning democracy in Pakistan However, the truth of this exercise is not lost on anyone. Come with us as we dive deeper into this new attempt by Pakistan to show that it actually does try to take steps for the prosperity of its people, however improbable that may sound. Donning green jackets. These enumerators are on a mission to count every individual across Pakistan by using tablets and mobiles. They are part of Pakistan's first ever digital population and household census, which aims to give a more accurate picture of the country's population and will help for future planning and utilization of resources before the next general elections. It is believed that population density data not only helps electoral seats in Pakistan's parliament, but helps assign funding for basic services like schools and hospitals. The data collected after the census will help shape policy decisions in Pakistan, which are now based on the 2017 census that counted the population at 207 million people. However, previous exercises have been marred by allegations of miscount and exclusion of transgender people and ethnic minorities. سنسس جو ہے یہ ڈیپینڈ کرتا ہے انتخابات میں انتخابات میں اس کے حوالے سے سیٹیں بنیں گی اور سیٹیں بنیں گی تو اس پہ ویسی اعتراضات آلریڈی ہیں کہ سیٹیں کم ہیں یا زیادہ ہیں کہیں ووٹر زیادہ ہیں کہیں ووٹر کم ہیں تو یہ اس حوالے سے تو شکایات آلریڈی موجود ہیں اب اگر اس سنسس کے وجہ سے پھر کچھ اس طرح کی چیزیں بڑھ گئیں تو آپ کا الیکشن جو ہے وہ بھی جو ہے شکوں کو شبہ سے دیکھا جائے گا اور ہو سکتا ہے کہ پولیٹیکل پارٹیز اس کے حوالے سے کوئی اپنا لائے عمل تیار کریں کوئی ایسا لائے عمل جو آگے جا کے کوئی کسی پروٹس میں تبدیل ہو جائے There is already division amongst political parties in the country over the digital census. Pakistan's foreign minister, Bilawal Bhutto, who is also the leader of Pakistan's People Party, termed the census a flawed exercise. His party is part of a coalition at the center of the spectrum, under the banner of the Pakistan Democratic Movement, which was formed against then Prime Minister Imran Khan. The digital census in Pakistan has many other hurdles to overcome, as it will need to reach high conflict areas within the country, where data collection has been proven to be a difficult task. In the Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa provinces of Pakistan, 
a large number of people in the remote areas have no access to information. Also, an armed struggle against the government and the army is ongoing in these provinces, which poses a significant hurdle to the census's accuracy. In Pakistan-occupied Kashmir and Gilgit-Baltistan, the regions under Islamabad's forceful occupation, people have already begun resisting and have refused to be a part of the digital census. Massive protests have erupted in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir and Gilgit-Baltistan, as the residents here do not call themselves Pakistani citizens, and they have demanded the scrapping of the digital census in the occupied regions. Now, Pakistan has launched census 2023. They're counting how many people are in Punjab, how many people are in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, how many people here, how many people there. So, in this census, they come to Pakistani occupied Jammu Kashmir and they ask people, they are asking people to sign and they are putting their names under the column called Pakistan. When we are not Pakistan, we are a disputed territory, we are under occupation of Pakistan. While other countries took years of preparation to carry out population censuses digitally, Pakistan rolled out its self-designed digital census project in less than a year. Its accuracy and efficacy raises many doubts amongst critics. According to Pakistani media, the Pakistan Bureau of Statistics launched the census within three months with no surety of fulfilling recommendations by the United Nations Statistical Commission. The authenticity and secrecy of the data collected through Pakistan's digital census also remains in question. Experts even believe that the government may use the digital data for political advantage instead of efficient resource allocation for its people. Already facing mass distrust by the population, it remains to be seen whether this census exercise will be another Pakistani waste of resources and time. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. US and South Korea's Marine Corps last week conducted their first large-scale amphibious landing exercises in five years after the North unveiled what they claimed as new and smaller nuclear warheads. Amphibious armored vehicles of the two countries along with other naval ships Aircraft and helicopters joined the Sangyong exercise of the coast of the eastern city of Pohang, which kicked off on March 20 and will last until April 3. The exercises follow the docking of a U.S. carrier strike group led by the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz at South Korea's Busan Naval Base last week after the joint drills. It was the carrier's first visit in nearly six years and coincides with the 70th anniversary of the U.S.-South Korea alliance. Also last week, North Korea unveiled new, smaller nuclear warheads and vowed to produce more weapons-grade nuclear material to expand its arsenal, state news agency KCNA reported. Pyongyang has accused the United States and South Korea of rehearsing an invasion with their military exercises. Thousands of Israelis came out in support of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's judicial overhaul plan last week, blocking a highway in Tel Aviv after months of anti-government protests converged the country. Police said they were responding to a group who blocked the Ilon Freeway, the scene of almost weekly stoppages by protesters who see in Netanyahu's plan a threat to judicial independence. Netanyahu, on a trial on corruption charges he denies, says reforms are needed to balance out branches of government. Beset by the domestic upheaval and expressions of concern and disapproval in Washington, Netanyahu last week paused the overhaul to allow negotiations on a compromise between his religious nationalist coalition and opposition parties.
Myanmar's junta chief Aung Heleng last week said lawful actions would be taken against terrorist opposition forces. During a speech on Armed Forces Day to mark the 78th anniversary of the founding of its national army, the military known as the Tamta Daw celebrated with a parade of troops and weapons in the capital Nepito for the third year since overthrowing the elected government of Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi on February 1, 2021. Meanwhile, the United States announced further sanctions against Myanmar targeting the supply of jet fuel to Myanmar's military following air strikes in civilian populated areas the US Treasury Department said Moving on Temples across India were decked up and processions were carried out with religious fervor as Hindus mark the holy festival of Ram Navmi the birth anniversary of Lord Ram Join us as we take you on an optical drive of the festival. The Indian cultural landscape was filled with grandeur and gaiety as Hindu devotees across the country mark the birth anniversary of Lord Ram, Ram Navmi. Devotees congregated at nearby temples, carried out processions, and offered sacrament to the deity, who was deeply regarded in Hinduism for his victory over demon. Ravan Lord Ram is the seventh incarnation of Lord Vishnu who descended the earth in the form of a perfect man The temples were decorated with flowers and earthen lamps were placed Devotees say it brings positivity in their lives Chaitra Mas ke Shukla Paksh ki Navmi ek sath do adhyatmik divas ka jo hai उसको मनाया जाता है एक और जहां इसी दिन मर्यादा पुरुषोत्तम भगवान श्री राम का अवतरण हुआ वहीं दूसरी तरफ आज ही के नवमी के दिन जितने भी व्रत हैं जितने भी अनुष्ठान हैं उन सब का जो पारायण था तो उसे भी संपूर्णता का दिवस है A large number of people also took out devotional processions and chanted slogans of Jai Shri Ram, a popular Indian slogan wishing victory to Lord Ram. Merry making and dancing on the beats of drums was a sight to watch during the celebration of the event. Chariots which carried idols of Lord Ram were richly adorned. Aaj Ram Navami ka jolus niklega aur bahut sare स्थान गुजरते हुए एकदम सीधा चेतला हनुमान मंदिर तक की शोभा यात्रा जाएंगे पूरा पश्चिम बंगाल में एक करोड़ से अधिक लोग इस बार रामनवमी के जोलोस में भाग ले रहे हैं एज पर ट्रेडिशंस इन हिंदुइज्म लॉर्ड राम इज कंसीडर्ड द सुप्रीम पावर ही इज द सेंट्रल फिगर ऑफ द एंशिएंट हिंदू एपिक Ramayan and is known as king of Ayodhya the city believed to be Lord Ram's birthplace The stories of Ram present him as the embodiment of valor and virtue The great epic Ramayan is narrated in many temples and places of pilgrimage A Ram temple which according to claims will be the biggest and the most beautiful architecture the country has seen to date is being constructed in the holy city of Ayodhya. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.